Yes, I, I, I'm Richard Wilson. I've been um, most of my career in experimental physics, uh, in preliminary elementary particle physics right from the beginning. And uh, I moved to Harvard University some 53 years ago now and been working there until um, I still work there, but I'm officially retired right now. Well, I was aware of the nuclear energy issues right from the beginning. I remember very particularly the first bomb going off in, uh, uh, I was running a Boy Scout camp in southern England and the boy came back from the farm who could be collecting milk and said that there's a thing called an atomic bomb has fallen on Japan. What's an atomic bomb? And I just knew enough physics to understand what it must be. And uh, then, we, of course, there was a standard conversation in the physics department, coffee time. And one of the interesting things we thought at that time, uh, we all thought that within, the, uh, that within 10 years there'd be 100 countries with nuclear bombs, uh, but no one would have more than 10. And, of course, we were wrong on both sides. <laughs> there were only eight countries with nuclear bombs, and some of them <laughs> have several thousand, which is, um, to my mind, completely, completely absurd. What switched about um, 1970, I was in, in favor of using domestic nuclear power, but the anti-nuclear movement started building up about 1970, and students started asking me questions about how can I oppose nuclear power. And suddenly, uh, so you, better, you better do a reading course to me, what's it all about nuclear power. I soon realized the problems with nuclear power are mostly not the problems with nuclear physics, they're problems with heat transfer and hotness, and student very quickly lost interest, but I had continued. And I, I got very busy. It was about the same time I was moving into the, thinking about energy problems. And more than energy problems, I realized that there was no, uh, the whole environmental movement had no good quantitative way of looking at things. And so uh, that's been the field I've been in, I call, I call risk analysis. And uh, uh, and you ask a speciality, and say, I'm, I'm now I'm an expert on anything that's dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> Risks of chemicals and arsenic in, right. arsenic in Southeast Asia is my big problem now. We'll still have an increased population because we've increased, um, uh, it, it'll take time for that to, to flatten out. But it looks very, like, very much, for whatever reason, we're flattening out at 10th. At, at about 10 billion. And is that does that feel like a sustainable number to you? Yes. In terms of feeding people, conflict, uh, climate change? I doubt they'll be able to be fed as quite as well as we are in the United States. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I think in due course the United States standard of living will slowly drop. So have we overshot? I hope not, but we, know, we don't know. <laughs> uh, actually, it's remarkable how, how progress has gone. Uh -huh. Because... Uh, um, I just think of my grandfather's life in, in Northern England, my, then my father's life, and then my life. And I'm not a believer in what's called the good old days. I'm a believer in what are called the bad old days. With that, I don't really know. But, but one thing I, do, I am sure of, that carbon dioxide is a very important parameter in climate change. That's been first postulated by, uh, or it first postulated the Earth was a greenhouse by Fourier in 1829, I think it was, in a little article in Comte Landu. Then it was, uh, it was Tyndall about 1870 realized the carbon dioxide was very important, and the calculation of what, uh, how it affected uh, global change was Arrhenius, 1897, a little article in a Philosophical Magazine. Mm -hmm. His numbers, by the way, are almost exactly the same as we have right now because uh, the, the uncertainty is about the same whether you do it on a piece of paper, on, on two pieces of paper on a com big computer. But uh, the, so whether that's happening or not, we do know that we are making a change in an important climate parameter, which is carbon dioxide, at a rate which is larger, ever, greater than ever before. And this is an experiment we pro probably... We may be able to do it twice or three times in human society, but the next thousand years, this is it. And it behooves to do it sufficiently slowly mm -hmm. that we can figure out what's going on and how we're doing it.
Yeah. And the, the, so slowing down the, the, the rate of climate change is, I think, a vitally important decision. Forty years ago, scientists were listened to much more than they are now in Washington. And that's because, particularly physicists, because we built the atomic bomb. And that seemed to be very important for, for our politics. And physicists could do it nowadays, since about 19... It started about 1970. It started getting ignored. Um, one big example, the present moment, are the anti-ballistic missile systems, which they were discussed with Teller, was here, uh, well, the first meeting I was here, was Teller, and there was Velikov from the Soviet Union, I was here, Dick Garwin was here, and we also knew that uh, um, the, uh, 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 my, my brother Oponovsky gave testimony against the ABMs 40 years ago in the Senate. And, and, the, uh, and by the way, two days after he died last year, his article came out in the San Francisco Chronicle, Missiles to Defense. All, no, almost all physicists agree that no sensible government should take any political action on the understanding that an anti-ballistic missile system would do any damn good. But the political expedience just trumps and the... the uh... and the biggest single losses in the United States are deceiving the American people that there's a technical solution to a political problem. <laughs> there isn't. <laughs> and this is, we, I, we find that I find that very frustrating. And it's not. Uh, but that's, that seems to get at this question of whether science can actually affect policy. Uh, it does indeed. And that's one of the things that the, this particular seminar group is trying to do. And uh, through the Italian government. I may have, you have much more pro, uh, easier for someone through an Italian yeah. government to influence the American government than an American scientist influence the American government. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> um, but you still feel it's worthwhile to keep at it. Um, uh, is there any other? Is there any other? Uh, uh, what option do I have? I could go down to Hilton Head, and I could take a little club and knock a ball around the course, and. Uh, I don't find that very attractive thought. <laughs> but, but I do do it occasionally. I go down to an accelerator, and we have about 10 billion little things called electrons, which we shoot down the accelerator, and we knock them around, and we even put a spin on them. <laughs> and we watch what happens. I find that much more fun. <laughs>